Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon if you're in Ireland or someplace beyond the United States. It's a great pleasure to welcome Minister Simon Coveney to this Aspen Security Forum discussion this morning. As you know, Minister uh, Coveney is in Washington, D.C. for important meetings with the Trump administration, as well as senior members of the Congress. Uh, he's in the nation's capital today, but he's also in another capital because this is a virtual session and the moderator I'm in Massachusetts. Welcome, Minister, to the capital of Irish America, which is Boston and Massachusetts. Uh, as all of you know, Minister Coveney is Minister of Foreign Affairs and Defense. He's leader, also Deputy Leader of Fine Gael. He has served in many ministerial positions before. He's had a long career in Irish politics, has been in the Doyle uh, since 1998, uh, and he's a great friend of the United States. So we welcome him. We welcome the ambassador of the Republic of Ireland, Dan Mulhall. Uh, and Ambassador Mulhall, of course, is on Twitter. And today he tweeted out that it's an auspicious day, the 175th anniversary of the historic meeting in Dublin between Daniel O'Connell and Frederick Douglass. Here's what Douglass said, according to the ambassador, the poor trampled slave of Carolina had heard the name of the liberator with joy and hope. Thank you 175 years later to the Irish for receiving that son of America, an escaped slave, Frederick Douglass. I also just wanted to welcome Neve King. Neve, uh, born in uh, Cork, grew up in Galway, now deputy director of the Aspen Security Forum and Aspen Strategy Group. The meeting, this meeting wouldn't have happened without her. Minister, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. Um, very, very pleased to be here and always pleased to be introduced as a friend of the US. And uh, it's also nice to hear that uh, in the story of Frederick Douglass, uh, that Ireland uh, through history has been a refuge uh, for some coming from the US, uh, coming in our direction across the Atlantic, because of course, so many traveled in the other direction and have been part of building this extraordinary country. Uh, as indeed Nick, you and Neve have uh, have also in terms of your Irish uh, connections. So it's a real privilege and pleasure for me to be uh, to be here uh, to have a an open discussion with you this morning. Um, and uh, thank you very much to to all of your members for uh, for tuning in online. Normally we could meet in person um, uh, and uh, and build the kind of relationships that come from from meeting in person politically, but. You know, we're living in, in a strange and new environment uh, where um, meeting people via video conference on screen uh, seems to be uh, part of our ordinary day work at this stage. Well, it certainly is. And uh, we'll, we'll look forward to inviting you back to Washington in a normal environment, but also up here to Harvard and Boston College and, and Boston, Massachusetts. Minister, um, you're very busy. I know you're, you're seeing our leadership today. We've only got an hour. I want to give you a chance to, to talk about Ireland's approach to foreign and defense policy, particularly the fact that you've now been elected to the Security Council and you'll be on the council in what should be a very eventful uh, couple of years. So I give the floor to you. Following that, I'll just have a few questions to ask you. And then for the audience, we'll go right to the audience. If you'd like to ask a question of the minister, just press the blue raise hand button. I'll call on as many people as possible. But minister, you're welcome. And uh, I give the floor to you. Thanks, Nick. And uh, first of all, uh, as I said earlier, it's, it's a real honor to, to, to address this audience because uh, it's an informed, experienced audience on foreign policy and security issues. Um, I happen to have the privilege of being both Minister for Foreign Affairs in Ireland, but also Minister for Defense. Um, and uh, I looked for those two policy briefs to be linked together in the one ministry, which is now the case, uh, even though they are two separate, separate government departments in Ireland. Uh, but we are, leading, uh, we are living through an extraordinary time of change globally. Um, and if you, uh, if you think about that um, in the context of trying to manage a global pandemic, uh, seeing the, the infrastructure that protects multilateralism being undermined uh, by uh, a number of significant uh, global superpowers. Um, if you look at the challenges that my country faces at the moment in the context of a rapidly changing relationship with our closest neighbor in the context of the UK leaving the European Union. Um, if you look at what is uh, driving change and migration across the world 
coming from conflict, uh, climate change, uh, d regional disputes over natural resources, uh, and of course, rapid population growth in parts of the world uh, that are struggling to, to manage uh, that population change and the demands that come with that. Uh, you see that for a small country like Ireland, having an international voice that can influence global decisions uh, that ultimately um, uh, can provide, I hope, solutions to some of these global challenges. Uh, you realize why, uh, as an island at the center of the world, which is the way we see Ireland, uh, both politically and geographically, in the Atlantic, part of the uh, European Union, but very, very close to the United States, uh, a country that exports 85% of everything it produces, uh, a country that has a very small military capacity, which is really designed around peacekeeping as opposed to defense, uh, a country that is militarily non-aligned uh, to NATO, uh, but at the same time works with um, multiple uh, security uh, international agencies uh, from a peace building and peacekeeping perspective. Uh, we are a country that really survives on the back of multilateralism working, uh, international engagement working, uh, and that is why for us uh, our membership of the United Nations is so important, uh, and that is why for us taking a seat on the U UN Security Council, uh, being able to influence global affairs, uh, working with uh, very large and powerful countries in the context of the P5 uh, and, and others uh, who are members of the Security Council uh, is such an important opportunity from an Irish perspective to reinforce uh, what Ireland is about internationally, which is building relationships, solving problems collectively through argument and intellect, as opposed to, uh, to military or economic might and muscle. Um, and uh, the opportunity uh, that, that we are going to get from the 1st of January is the fourth time Ireland has been on the UN Security Council, uh, roughly once every 20 years. Uh, and I hope we will be able to work in partnership with the United States, who has been a, a close friend of Ireland for so many years, um, uh, to ensure that the, the mutual interests that both uh, Ireland uh, and the US have in bringing about peace and stability protecting a rules-based international order uh, that allows big and small countries to thrive and survive and grow and trade uh, and solve uh, conflicts, both internal and external, um, that, um, that Irish diplomacy and Irish politics can play a role on the Security Council to do that. We have uh, already uh, outlined essentially three key approaches to our Security Council membership, which uh, uh, members listening may find interesting. Uh, the, uh, and all of the areas, I think, are areas that Ireland has international credibility, which makes sense. Uh, first of all, in relation to peacekeeping and peace enforcement. I mean, we've had effectively UN peacekeepers in the field since 1958, uh, unbroken, uh, in places like southern Lebanon since 1978, uh, and uh, uh, in many African countries and indeed across the Middle East. Uh, and so we want to be very much part of shaping peacekeeping mandates and peace enforcement mandates in the future for UN peacekeeping interventions. The second area uh, where I think we have credibility is, uh, uh, is around conflict prevention in the first place. Uh, and this is something that I think is, is gaining traction within the UN, uh, uh, driven by the, the, um, uh, the General Secretary. Uh, who uh, is really keen that the UN would find a way of intervening earlier to prevent conflicts, um, so as not to have to focus quite so much on conflict management and post-conflict management. Uh, and that means uh, UN infrastructure being far more interventionist uh, and sharper and more to the point uh, in terms of uh, seeing where early intervention can make a difference and actually funding that uh, in terms of intensive diplomacy and mediation where necessary. And then the third area where I think uh, Ireland might find a little bit more controversy is, is accountability. Um, you know, we, uh, if we're going to have a credible United Nations, well then, uh, countries that bre breach the charter, that break international law, that are responsible for crimes against humanity, uh, or uh, the use of chemical weapons, uh, or whatever the case may be, we have got to have a more 
effective accountability mechanism through the UN and through international justice. Uh, we are big supporters of the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, I know we, we differ uh, from a policy perspective with the US on that, and we deeply regret this summer uh, that the US uh, has made a decision to effectively apply sanction to, uh, to members of, that, um, of the ICC uh, you know, in a way that has quite a chilling impact, in fact. Uh, um, but our approach generally to accountability uh, isn't solely focused on the ICC. There are, of course, many other um, accountability mechanisms that can work, not least the Security Council itself uh, in terms of uh, interventions. And, we, you know, we've seen, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the use of the veto in a way that blocks that accountability and blocks early intervention in a way that could potentially have saved thousands of lives uh, in multiple different uh, circumstances and conflicts. Uh, probably the best example of that is the inability for the Security Council to intervene uh, in relation to the use of chemical weapons in Syria with horrific impact uh, on civilians uh, and women and children in particular. Um, so, so these three thematic areas, I think, will be areas where Ireland, I hope, can work with the United States uh, to build credible solutions. Um, you know, Ireland is a pragmatic country uh, in terms of making progress on the agendas that we're involved in. Uh, we're not purists. Uh, we understand the complexities uh, of uh, international diplomacy and international politics. For us, it's about getting things done uh, and building partnerships that can do that. Uh, people might also find it interesting to, to, to hear the, the policy areas that we're likely to be asked to take on responsibility within the Security Council. Uh, it looks at the moment uh, as if Ireland will, ask, uh, will, will be asked uh, to take on uh, the chair of the Sanctions Committee uh, in relation to Somalia uh, on the Horn of Africa. Uh, it looks from a policy point of view that, uh, that, that we will chair, at least for, for some of our time on the Security Council, uh, the, the Policy Committee on Women, Peace and Security. And perhaps most interesting for the United States, it looks as if we may be uh, uh, asked to coordinate uh, on what's called the JCPOA, which is the Iranian nuclear uh, deal or the controversies uh, and political debates around that, which would be a very, very political brief for Ireland to, to try to coordinate. And obviously, uh, the relationship with Washington on that brief is very sensitive and very important uh, for us uh, in the weeks and months ahead. So that gives you a sense of, of where Ireland stands internationally, uh, why the Security Council for us is such an important part of Irish foreign policy every two decades or so uh, for a small country that sees itself in many ways as a global citizen uh, to be uh, around the, uh, the table uh, de debating and discussing global conflict, how we respond to that, uh, developing security concerns internationally, uh, and how um, different countries around the world can create solidarity uh, and a, uh, a sense of purpose around collective solutions, uh, while at the same time recognizing the divisions uh, within the Security Council and within global politics right now, the tensions uh, between the US and China, the US and Russia, uh, and obviously the, the outflow of those tensions that make solutions uh, very, very difficult uh, on some of the conflict and conflict zones uh, around the world right now. So that, maybe that gives you a sense uh, of our global perspective. Uh, in terms of our uh, Atlantic, European, and US perspective, um, uh, Ireland is trying to ensure that we protect our own interests in the context of the UK's changing relationship with Europe right now. Um, and some of you will be familiar with the complexity of Brexit negotiations and why Ireland has found itself in the spotlight and right in the middle of those negotiations for nearly four years now um, to ensure that we protect the peace process on our own island, to ensure that we prevent uh, effectively the, uh, the economic partition uh, of our island through the imposition of border infrastructure between North and South, and how we have managed through negotiation to resolve most of those issues and to finalize and sign off on a treaty between the EU and the UK this time last year that solves virtually all of those issues as long as the British government follows through on their commitments uh, and their obligations under international law now. 
uh, in terms of, um, uh, of those Irish-related uh, Brexit issues. Um, so look, I look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, and uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity to give you a, a brief introduction uh, on Ireland's attitude uh, to the rest of the world, which I hope uh, is a progressive one, is a constructive one, and most importantly, uh, we'll be able to build um, uh, partnerships and alliances with the US uh, on the UN Security Council for the next two years. Mr. Thank you very much. That was a very good uh, introduction to an overview of what Ireland hopes to accomplish with your three-point agenda on the Security Council. I think you're right that if Ireland is to coordinate the future of the Iran nuclear agreement, the JCPOA, that's going to be front and center uh, for the United States to have to decide what the future is going to hold. I just wanted to ask you two questions, and then we're going to go to questions from participants. We also have, we already have people lining up to ask them of the minister. Minister, my first question is this. Um, the United States relied very much on the United Kingdom when the United Kingdom was a member of the European Union to be sometimes a conduit of sensitive information, sometimes a referee in disputes between Brussels, the Commission, uh, and the United States government. With Britain out, um, is it possible that Ireland could play in part that role because of the very close relationship that the United States and the confidence and trust the US, both parties, has in the Irish government, but also because of your very good standing and strong standing in the EU itself? Is that part of the potential of the US-Irish relationship? Uh, yes, is the straight answer to that, Nick. I mean, I think if you look at the role that Ireland, for example, has played in the context of the Brexit negotiations for a number of years now, you know, I think it is proof that small countries and their concerns matter uh, and that small countries have the capacity to intervene on big and challenging uh, issues uh, with solutions um, that can work. Uh, so for me, um, you know, it, it, uh, Ireland has a, a history within the EU of trying to build bridges across the Atlantic. Uh, the last time Ireland had the presidency of the European Union, uh, we moved the agenda of the, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership forward in a substantial way. For all sorts of political reasons, that, that, that negotiation effectively collapsed uh, at a later stage. Uh, but Ireland is very interested in being a bridge builder between the EU and the US. Um, I don't think Ireland's gonna have a significant role from a NATO perspective. In fact, I don't think Ireland will have any role really in terms of the relationship between the US and European countries from a defense uh, and military perspective through NATO. But I think Ireland can have a very uh, important uh, role to play in terms of being a friend of the U.S., um, uh, being a, a vehicle that allows the U uh, U.S. to have channels into EU thinking, whether that's in the European Commission, whether it's in the European Council. Um, for me, uh, uh, the United States and the EU should be thinking about a transatlantic investment and economic partnership uh, that is uh, global in its thinking, uh, given the, the change uh, in terms of economic strength, uh, particularly coming from, from the Far East. Um, um, it makes sense, in my view, for two economies that are quite similar, i.e. the EU and the US, to work much more closely with each other in terms of building partnerships and building a trading arrangement uh, that can allow that transatlantic trade to, to grow substantially. Uh, and I think Ireland can play a very strategic role in that. You know, we are going to be well, we are actually now because Britain has left the European Union, even though they are still in the shelter of a transition arrangement. Uh, we are effectively the only common law English speaking country in the European Union right now. Um, we have, you know, deep roots in the United States. Uh, we have relationships already in, in Congress uh, and in the Senate and indeed in the White House, uh, regardless of, of who wins the upcoming presidential election. Uh, that I think can be used to, uh, to ensure that the EU understands a US perspective and vice versa, uh, to try to, um, uh, to build a better relationship transatlantic. Uh, I think that's needed. Um, and Ireland, I hope, will be used uh, as an honest vehicle to do that. Minister, thank you. I think you're exactly right to suggest that Ireland can play a bigger role. If you look at the examples of Norway, 
and the influence that it's had on the Oslo peace process for decades, the example of the United Arab Emirates in commerce and technology, and now in the politics of the Middle East. And look at the example of Singapore. These are all smaller countries who've had, who are punching well above their weight. Ireland has an advantage that none of the others have. Ireland's a member of the EU. So a lot of us on this side of the Atlantic hope that Ireland will be able to play that role. My final question before we go to questions is about Ireland. Um, Minister, you know that you've arrived just before our national election on the day of the first presidential debate. And we're about as divided as we've been in this country, red, blue, Republican, Democrat, North, South, as we've been in a long time. But it's interesting, we're not divided on Ireland. The Democratic Party, the Republican Party, fully support the Good Friday Agreement, fully support uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol so that there won't be um, a hard border uh, emerging uh, again in Ireland. And it was interesting to see that two weeks ago, Speaker Pelosi made a very important statement that I think was heard at 10 Downing Street that there'll be no US, UK free trade agreement if Britain, in the way it exits the, the European Union, seeks to reimpose a hard border. Um, Joe Biden said the same thing a couple of hours later. And Mick Mulvaney, President Trump's emissary, his negotiator in Ireland, said in Dublin uh, yesterday, today, excuse me, that he agreed there'll be no US-UK free trade agreement. That's remarkable harmony on one subject, Ireland. I assume that those messages have been heard in London, and I assume they've been welcome in Dublin. Very welcome, I think, in Dublin. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a reminder that the United States um, regards the Irish peace process as one of US foreign policy uh, success stories uh, in, you know, over the last three or four decades. Uh, and it is. You know, we would not have peace in Ireland if it hadn't been for the United States uh, in terms of intervention, support, uh, encouragement, and ongoing involvement, quite frankly, uh, in, uh, in politics in Northern Ireland and indeed in the Republic of Ireland. And so people like, you know, Congressman Richie Neal, Brendan Boyle, uh, but also people like Mick Mulvaney, uh, Speaker Pelosi, um, you know, you can name a lot of names from, from both the Republican and Democratic stable uh, politically, and indeed consecutive presidents um, that have shown a deep personal interest in ensuring that the peace process that so many people worked so hard to achieve and the tragedy that built up to that is sustained and maintained. Um, and when Brexit um, uh, was decided by the British people by referendum, the day after, uh, Ireland was thinking about how do we protect the peace process in the context of the UK as a whole, including Northern Ireland, leaving uh, the EU, because we knew that that was going to create huge complexity uh, in terms of preventing uh, the re-emergence of physical border infrastructure, which really was the symbol of division uh, and partition on the island of Ireland in the past, and so much tragedy. Uh, because, of course, when the United Kingdom is outside of the EU, there, are, there is a need for trading arrangements, for uh, sanitary and phytosanitary checks on the border, for customs arrangements on the border, for, uh, for standards and inspections around that, and so on. And so we started to map out how could Ireland ensure through negotiation uh, that we could design a solution through an international treaty that would prevent the need for physical border infrastructure re-emerging on the island of Ireland, while at the same time respecting the UK decision to leave the EU. Um, and we have come up with a solution for that. And it's been signed off on and agreed, and now has the protection of international law. But the US and uh, people who follow the peace process in the US have been following those negotiations every step of the way. Uh, and uh, and at times have intervened, particularly with the British government, to say, look, we respect your decision on Brexit, but we also expect you to respect the Good Friday Agreement, the peace process that we all worked on so hard, and of course, the future uh, relationship on the island of Ireland between the, the jurisdictions north and south and the people that live in both. Um, and, uh, and so I think that some in in Downing Street and in Westminster have been somewhat taken aback 
by just how emotionally connected and politically connected very senior U.S. politicians are with the Irish peace process and with the connection between Ireland and the U.S., uh, which is a historic one that is very, very strong still today. Um, so, so that is why the, the messaging from Mick Mulvaney, from Nancy Pelosi, from Richie Neal, from Brendan Boyle, from, from many others, uh, has been very, very clear. Uh, and that is to the UK, if you are reckless uh, with the peace process in Northern Ireland in the context of Brexit, if you don't follow through on the commitments that you've signed up to that has become international law in an international treaty that you designed and signed off on and ratified with the EU to solve the Irish issue, uh, to protect the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process there, if you don't follow through on those commitments, well then there will not be uh, a US-UK trade deal in the future, which of course the UK badly wants uh, and wants to negotiate quickly. Uh, and I think that message has landed in Westminster. Uh, it's made a number of people quite uncomfortable. It, it has resulted in uh, the, the British Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, coming to Washington in the last few weeks to try to explain the British government's approach. Um, uh, and I think the, the message that he carried home to London is a very clear one. Uh, and it's the same message that we give to London. You know, we are a friend of Britain. Um, just like the United States is. We have a special relationship with the UK. It's a complicated one. It's a tragic one at times, but it is a hugely special and hugely close one. Um, and so we want to work with Britain to solve these problems. But we will not allow Ireland and relationships on the island of Ireland to be collateral damage um, uh, uh, linked to a Brexit policy that breaches international law. Uh, and I think we have very strong support here in the U.S. Uh, on that issue. Thank you, Minister. You do have that support. It is bipartisan, and that is very. And I think that's going to continue no matter what happens in our presidential election. Minister, we have um, we have uh, a couple of people who want to ask questions. I'm going to go to James Densolo first. There may be a slight delay in bringing James up. You'll see him and hear him and respond to his question. James, please. Hey, James. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, I work for Save the Children, and I wanted to, uh, to say that Save the Children welcome Irish leadership on the process to agree a political declaration around avoiding the use of explosive weapons in conflict. I wondered whether you could expand on why Ireland is prioritizing leadership around this issue, and whether you see it as a controversial initiative or one that states can forge a consensus around. Yeah, and thanks for that question. Um, yeah, Ireland has a long history within the UN of advocating for disarmament generally, uh, in particular nuclear disarmament, but also uh, more recently we've been working a lot on the agenda uh, around the use of, of explosives in, uh, in urban and built-up built up areas uh, because of the devastating consequences they've had in so many conflict zones from Syria to Yemen to Libya, uh, and, uh, and many others, uh, particularly on civilians. Um, and so we want to, uh, and we will, uh, work in a very proactive way uh, to try to move this agenda forward on the, on the Security Council uh, uh, to ensure that there are consequences uh, for countries uh, that behave in a way uh, that disregards the, the interests of civilian safety in conflict particularly through the use of, um, of explosives in built-up areas. So, um, and uh, James, if you'd like to, to get in contact with me directly uh, from a Save the Children perspective, uh, we'd, we'd be very happy to, uh, to talk to you in more detail about that. Thank you, James. If you'd like to ask a question of the minister, please just press the blue raise hand button. We'll call you in order. The next up is Thomas Carty. Got to be an Irish connection there, Thomas. Right. There, I think it's coming in just a second. Am I? Can you hear me now? We hear you fine. Thank you so much. Please go ahead with your question, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Burns and uh, Minister. Uh, following up in a somewhat different vein of Save the Children, um, I, I know that over the years, through missionary efforts and Mary Robinson's efforts in the High Commission, there's been a strong um, 
strong effort and mission towards um, uh, children uh, and, and those in need. And just happened to be reading recently a collection of articles regarding uh, Ireland's uh, treatment of its children at home and particularly in connection with uh, mother and children institutions and Magdalen, Magdalen laundries and so forth. So I wonder how Ireland manages to maintain its space as a, um, um, an emblem of um, um, caring for children when it has been having such a difficulty in uh, taking care of its own folks at home uh, over the years in that regard. Yeah, no, uh, no, Thomas, that's a that's a very fair point. Um, and like so many countries, uh, Ireland has a dark history uh, in in some social areas, uh, particularly around um, uh, uh, unmarried mothers um, uh, of uh, of children who were abandoned into into homes uh, and into foster care. Um, and um, uh, we have. Uh, in recent years, uh, I think exposed uh, the the ugliness and the darkness and the truth uh, around uh, much of that in terms of mother and baby homes, Magdalene laundries, uh, children that were effectively um, sold in, into the United States as well uh, from Ireland, um, uh, taken from from mothers who were trying to hide pregnancy. Um, you know, it's it's almost hard to believe for my generation. Um, that 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 Ireland could have taken the approach that it did, um, with the endorsement and the support of religious leaders at the time, and indeed the either the ignorance or uh, the um, uh, the uh, the knowledge of uh, of senior politicians at the time as well. Um, so I, I I think the the way in which to judge countries uh, is not necessarily the uh, the, the detail or the darkness of elements of their history, but more importantly, how they address that now. Uh, and for us, it's about the truth. Uh, it's about uh, support and compensation and redress um, and learning lessons uh, from, um, from that kind of closed-minded society uh, towards, um, uh, uh, towards children and their welfare um, so that we can share those mistakes with other parts of the world to make sure that those um, uh, that that darkness uh, isn't repeated and that we shine a light on it. So, so for me, you know, I see this as as actually something that can add to Ireland's credibility or in terms of uh, of children parenting um, and um, some of what in the past would have been a hidden history, uh, so that we can learn lessons uh, and show to the rest of the world how we can now respond to those mistakes. And, you know, Ireland isn't alone in this. You know, many other parts of the English-speaking world in particular, uh, I think, have, have unfortunately similar stories to tell. Thank you, Minister. That's a difficult question. I appreciated your answer because you're right that all of us, including in the United States, have our dark periods of history. Ours is, we have several. Ours, our, our greatest, of course, our most existential is racism mistreatment of African-American slavery. And that's why Ambassador Mulhall's recalling of Frederick Douglass's visit to Dublin so long ago is so important. I think you're right to suggest we have to be acting now to redeem uh, our countries. And um, thank you for your answer. Donald Tyke. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Nick Burns, and uh, thanks to Ambassador Mohal. Um, Minister Covey, I'm with the Irish Network DC here in Washington, so we certainly regret that we can't be welcoming you in person, but thank you very much for your time and for this great discussion. You guys have discussed a little bit some of your formal and, and obviously well-nurtured relationships with America's formal political structures and agreed with Nick Burns across the political spectrum, and as you mentioned, both congressional and our executive branch folks. Ireland also is a global leader in diaspora engagement. And I know as a full government, you've been working on either even broadening and strengthening that globally and obviously including in the United States. And I'm wondering your thoughts from your prism of foreign affairs and defense. Do you see your engagement and the Republic's engagement with 
both the Irish diaspora in America and the broader Irish American community. Is there any aspect of soft power or public diplomacy that you think can play a role in those communities into the vision for Ireland globally as an Ireland, uh, island in the center of the world, but also with your UN post upcoming uh, to help influence that in any way? Welcome your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, nice car there. Uh, the, the, um, yeah, look, I, I mean, I see Ireland and, and Irishness not confined to the, the borders of the island that I live on. Um, you know, I see Ireland as a, in many ways, a global tribe. Uh, we have some si similarities actually with Israel uh, in that regard, um, uh, in terms of having networks all over the world, uh, people who, who help each other, uh, who support each other uh, through those networks. And of course, it can be very influential as well through business, through politics. Uh, you'll find that so many of the big US multinationals that invest heavily in Ireland have a, an Irish board presence on them um, who uh, you know, understand the relationships and the opportunities through Ireland uh, into the rest of the world uh, for US companies and so on. So, so for me, uh, we have a very active policy at the moment. Uh, it's called Global Ireland, uh, which is about uh, doubling Ireland's uh, global impact in terms of both footprint uh, as well as influence. Uh, in the last two years, we've opened over 10 new embassies and consulates around the world, in including some in the United States. Um, and we're going to do a lot more. And we're investing heavily in, in those networks. So, I mean, we financially support... Uh, many of the Irish networks across the U.S., but not just the U.S., in Canada too, in, in Australia too, in the U.K. as well, and, you know, in Buenos Aires as well, where we have, you know, about 200,000 people living in Buenos Aires that have, uh, you know, that are of Irish descent. Some of them aren't even English speaking. Um, so we have a, a vast global network uh, of relationships. Um, uh, and for me, while Ireland has been quite successful in terms of harnessing the influence of our, of our global presence through the, through the diaspora, I think we can do a lot more on that, quite frankly. Um, and we are very much focused in uh, investing in that. Uh, there are very few countries in the world that are actually investing in expanding their global footprint at the moment, whereas we very much are. Um, you know, we've opened new embassies in places like uh, Colombia, Chile, um, uh, we're going to be opening in, in Kiev uh, soon, uh, in, in Rabat, in Morocco. Um, we've opened new consulates, uh, a number of new consulates in the US, uh, in Vancouver, in Canada. Um, we've opened a new embassy in Wellington, New Zealand. And this is all in the last you know, year or so. Um, so, so for me, um, harnessing Ireland's uh, influence through its diaspora uh, ensuring that, that that diaspora feels connected and influential in terms of government decision making is important for us. Uh, we are going to have a referendum in Ireland to extend voting rights for presidential elections in Ireland to our global diaspora, uh, which for some is a controversial thing to do, but in my view is an obvious next step in terms of reaching out and trusting Irish people all over the world to be involved in responsible decision making in terms of choosing uh, who the next Irish president should be. Um, uh, and that is the kind of thinking, I hope, that will solidify the, the network of Irish influence globally uh, uh, to ensure that, uh, that it can be used to good, good effect in terms of, of Irish influence. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sense of, uh, of the kind of things that we're doing. Um, but we are we're very, very privileged as a small country to have the kind of access and influence that we have in the greatest country on earth, the, the United States. Um, and that is obviously, you know, the focus of the St. Patrick's Day um, celebrations each year, but, but it's more than that. And I think we're seeing that in the context of Brexit right now. I hope we can see it in the context of working with the United States on the Security Council and indeed on building a stronger uh, and more progressive transatlantic relationship in the future as well. But all of that is reinforced in many ways by the Irish diaspora and Irish networks all over the world, but particularly in the US. You know, cities like New York, Chicago, Washington, San Francisco, you know, generations of Irish people in positions of responsibility and influence uh, in a way that amplifies an Irish message 
uh, uh, that I think is the envy of many, many other countries in the world. And I'll just add Boston to that list, Minister. Sorry, Boston, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Boston, um, Boston is a given. Uh, it's a given, exactly. Minister, thank you for that. A lot of us see Ireland punching well above its weight, in part because of the trust that people have in the Irish government to play this kind of role that, that you've been describing. Minister, we have um, five people who want to ask questions. Let me just read them out so that people know what order is coming. I'll call on Morgan Bazilian next, and then Francisco Martin Rayo, and then Nate Smith, and then Kaya Smelly, and then Kieran McLaughlin. We'll try to fit you all in. We have 20 minutes. Uh, I think we can do it. So Morgan, you are next. Thank do you. It. Nick, do you want to take all five questions maybe now and I can try and answer them all then one after the other? Whatever you'd like to do, would that be easier for you? Yeah, well then we, we can ensure that we get the five questions in then and I'll try and be a little bit briefer with my answers. No, we're not, we're not asking you to be briefer. It's been fascinating to listen to you. Let's take the five all together. So um, first we've got uh, Mort. Minister, uh, nice to see you. Um, First to say, uh, well done both at this event and over the last years in your role. Uh, I've been watching uh, with some pleasure at how, how, how you're carrying yourself and, and, and Ireland. Uh, congratulations to you on the UN Security Council position. It's well deserved and Ireland will no doubt make a significant contribution. I had a very short question, just if you could expand a bit on what you think the role for Ireland might be on helping to move forward on the JCPOA. Thanks very much. Morgan, thank you for that on the JCPOA. Uh, Francisco Martin Rayo, you are next. Um, hi, Minister. Thank you again. I'm Francisco Martin Rayo. I'm a fellow at CNS. I used to be one of Nick's students at Harvard a while ago, so it's good to see you. Um, very quickly to Nick's point on Ireland punching way above its weight. I mean, clearly we've seen the power of Irish soft diplomacy, soft power. Um, on the military side, I think we've seen other nations of similar size punch way above their weight as well through asymmetric capabilities. Be interesting to hear over the next decade or so how you feel about Ireland's kind of strategy and development of asymmetric capabilities. Francisco, thank you so much. It's a good subject for us to, co to cover. Uh, Nate Smith, you're next. Great, thank you very much, Minister and, and Ambassador Burns. First of all, Minister, you have a fantastic team in the DC, Washington DC embassy from the ambassador and the deputy ambassador all the way down. So kudos to you all. Uh, with the change with the UK leaving the EU and a political leadership change in Germany and some, some other changes going on in Europe as well, my question is, what do you, what does your crystal ball see for the future of the EU in the next five to six years, both internally and its relationship with the U.S. and um, other parts of the world. Nate, thank you. Topical. That's a very topical question today in the United States. Thank you very much. Kaya Smelly, please. You are next to ask your question of Mr. Simon Coveney. Yes, I just wanted to ask how Ireland's position with the Security Council in the UN, how that's going to put them on the center stage with, you know, how they deal with their diplomacy with, you know, with showing everyone. Thank you very, very much, um, uh, Kaya. And finally, uh, Kieran McLaughlin. Hey, Kieran. Karen, are you uh, with us? Nick, if you want, I can answer the other questions while, while well, Karen. Yeah, we'll try to bring Karen in at the end. Thanks, Minister. Hello, yeah. Hello Minister. Oh. oh, hi, Karen. Oh, Minister, hi, how are you? 
Yeah. Very sorry. Uh, Minister, very best wishes on your meetings over the coming days. Very quick question. Ireland obviously is one of the most open, uh, competitive economies in the world, relied tremendously on foreign direct investment. Um, we do a great job in attracting that. However, we are obviously one of the most exposed to nativism, the uh, uh, chaos wrought by COVID, et cetera, et cetera, the contraction in international trade. What's the essence of Ireland's proposition uh, uh, in the coming months as, as we recover and the world recovers, particularly given uh, the greater demand for sustainable and impact investment opportunities? Thanks to all. Thanks, Kieran, to ask questions. Minister, I'm just going to add to the degree of difficulty. It's a question I'll just add to your list um, that a lot of Americans are thinking about, Irish Americans, um, and that is what is the possibility or even the probability in the next decade or two uh, you might achieve on the island of Ireland, a united Ireland? I know it's difficult and complicated as we look at the United Kingdom a great friend and ally of the United States. And we wish the UK to strengthen in the future. But you have to be realistic looking at the possibilities of what the Scots will do and what will happen with Northern Ireland. So your thoughts on this big question that I know a lot of us who are Irish American have been talking about, uh, and we would appreciate your opinion and the floor is yours. Yeah, well, just uh, lots of easy questions there, Nick. Uh, um, the, the, um, first of all, uh, Morgan, who, who brought his, his car number plate with him from Dublin uh, back in 1998. Um, uh, the, um, um, first of all, can I say that, that, that you know, Ireland's um, responsibilities in the context of the Security Council have not been confirmed yet? Um, so, so when I say that Ireland may have a role to play in terms of coordinating on the JCPOA, uh, that is that is a possibility, if not a hopefully a probability. But um, the um, uh, those those positions haven't been finalised uh, and confirmed yet. But uh, my understanding is that the likely responsibilities we we will have are the ones that I outlined earlier: Women, Peace, and Security, the Sanctions Committee in Somalia, uh, and a a coordinating role in relation to to the JCPOA, which um, well. Uh, as, as people who follow these things will know, has been a source of enormous division and tension uh, in, in, well, in recent days, uh, never mind recent months and years. Um, so the European Union has taken a, a, different, uh, a different approach. Uh, we believe that the, G the JCPOA is worth saving and protecting. Uh, we think it is the most effective way of ensuring that Iran doesn't develop a nuclear weapon. Um, uh, it facilitates significant uh, access in terms of inspection and reporting. Uh, it has a, a series of, of pretty onerous uh, obligations uh, for the Iranian um, government to follow. Um, and while it's not perfect, um, uh, we believe that it, it is at least something uh, and is a foundation stone that we should be building from uh, as opposed to removing. Uh, I know the US has a very different perspective um, and they very much link uh, uh, the, uh, the JCP, JCPOA issues uh, and potential of a nuclear armed Iran with the role that Iran plays uh, in a very destructive way uh, across the, uh, the region uh, and in terms uh, of accessing ballistic missiles uh, and so on uh, and using them. Um, so, you know, this is something that Again, uh, if Ireland does have a responsibility in this space, uh, we want to try to be a consensus and a bridge builder uh, in a very, very divisive file. Um, uh, but as I say, I don't want to uh, take as read um, that we will be in that role, but my understanding is that there is a, a reasonably good chance that we will be. Um, uh, but that is certainly the approach we will take, to listen to everybody. Um, and to different perspectives and to try to work towards building understanding and consensus, which is what Ireland is good at, uh, quite frankly, and it's what small countries need to be good at uh, to survive in, uh, uh, in, um, in an environment like the Security Council uh, with obviously big and powerful uh, people around the table. In terms of uh, 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 the question around asymmetric capabilities, 
Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's important to recognize Ireland's limitations militarily. I mean, they are significant. Uh, we, uh, we have focused on, and yeah, I've been the Minister for Defence before in Ireland. Um, when I was last there, we, we produced a, a new white paper on the future of defence in Ireland. Uh, I'm about to launch a new commission on defence in Ireland uh, in the next six to eight weeks. Uh, with some with international presence on that commission as well to, to examine what Ireland needs in terms of defence infrastructure given the changing world that, that we live in, um, uh, including uh, the, the asymmetric uh, threats uh, that Ireland, just like virtually every other country, faces. Uh, the challenges we have around cybersecurity, uh, around the kind of interventions that we now need to guard against that simply wouldn't have been thought possible a decade ago uh, in terms of intervening uh, de uh, in democratic systems, in elections, um, you know, and um, uh, creating unrest uh, and destabilizing countries uh, through um, asymmetric approaches to, uh, uh, to, um, to conflict and, and, and instability. So within the European Union, we have certainly experienced some of that in the context of the relationship with Russia. Um, and, uh, uh, and I think we need to be more and more aware of it. There's a lot of conversation within the European Union on this issue, particularly around the cyber threats that we face. Um, and of course, the European Union has created a center of excellence in Estonia on that uh, and is sharing a lot of information. So uh, Ireland will be investing in this space, but, I, um, but not from a sort of war going capacity perspective but from a, a, a defense perspective to ensure that we can contribute and protect the assets and interests that we have in Ireland, uh, many of which are multinational uh, um, uh, in nature. So, you know, Ireland hosts uh, and looks after the security of, you know, very significant multinationals in Ireland um, holding uh, huge uh, amounts of data, for example, uh, and we need to make sure that our cybersecurity uh, capacity is uh, uh, is is able and appropriate uh, to uh, to respond to the um, to the potential threats uh, to that data. Um, in terms of um, the European Union and its future, yeah, I, I mean, I think in some ways the uh, the the media coverage that Brexit gets in Ireland and indeed gets this side of the Atlantic. Uh, disguises the, the other changes that are happening within the European Union. So we have new leadership in the European Commission. We have new leadership in the European Council. Uh, we have a new template in terms of the setting of political priorities for the European Union that is uh, being, uh, being developed and agreed right now. Uh, we've just agreed to a new seven-year budget, uh, which involves an enormous amount of money uh, in terms of rebuilding the European economy post-COVID, um, and of course, we have uh, increased a new ambition in terms of the EU being more assertive in other parts of the world, uh, trying to impact uh, in a positive way, particularly in our neighborhood, i.e. in the Middle East and Africa, um, uh, in terms of some of the challenges that we face there that I referred to earlier. Uh, so I think the EU would certainly like to see the US as a partner uh, in, uh, in all of that ambition. Um, uh, and that's why I think it is regrettable that the EU and the US have taken a very different approach to a lot of foreign policy issues uh, in recent years, uh, where the EU has really tried to reinforce multilateralism, where in many ways foreign policy coming from, from the US in recent years has really been about transactional diplomacy uh, and uh, bilateralism really in terms of foreign policy, not in all areas, but, but certainly in many. So, you know, if you look at moving away, uh, the, the approach to moving away from the JCPOA, moving away from the World Health Organization, moving away from the Paris Agreement, um, moving away from uh, the UN, UN Human Rights Council, you know, the absence of the US in these bodies is, uh, 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 allows other you know, powerful actors uh, globally to fill that vacuum. And I don't believe that's in the US's interest. It's certainly not in the EU interest. We want to see a US presence in all of these multilateral uh, fora, even if there's difficult debate um, that sometimes uh, frustrates the US. 
Um, so certainly from an Irish perspective, uh, that is what we'd like to see. But if you're asking me, um, you know, the European Union as a project, uh, in my view, it will be strengthened in the years ahead. Uh, we will miss the UK. Uh, the EU will be weaker without Britain's presence. Uh, it'll be different, but in my view, weaker. But I also think the, the, the UK will, uh, and its place in the world will be weaker for not being part of the, the solidarity that's provided within the European Union as well, unfortunately. Uh, so it's a lose-lose for both sides um, uh, from a Brexit perspective. But that being said, um, you know, I think the, um, uh, the forces that pull the European Union together are far stronger than the political division that actually drives uh, division within the, uh, the European Union. So I'm, I'd be pretty confident about its, its future, its strength. But I do think that we need a European Union that is, that is more assertive and clearer in terms of global and international messaging. Uh, and I hope that, that we can build the kind of relationship with the United States that creates a very, very powerful partnership on a transatlantic basis on so many of these agendas. Um, in terms of, uh, of Ireland uh, and diplomacy uh, on the, the Security Council, look, I, you know, I don't want to um, overplay Ireland's um, effectiveness from a diplomacy point of view. We're a small country. Um, we try to have a big voice. Um, you know, the, um, the, the term that was used by a former U.S. president uh, talking about the soft bigotry of low expectations, uh, I apply that to small countries, even though it was originally uh, about education and disadvantage. Uh, for me, some, con some small countries, because they're small, uh, seem to accept low expectations in terms of an international presence or, or an international voice. I don't buy into that. Uh, in my view, small countries can have uh, big ideas uh, that can uh, play a part in international diplomacy uh, and in solving many of the global challenges that we face together. And certainly, uh, I hope Ireland, you know, as a bridge builder, uh, as a, a country that has no notions about our own grandeur or, or influence internationally, but instead approaches these things through pragmatism uh, with a humble uh, and, um, uh, and friendly tone that's non-threatening uh, to people. I hope we'll be able to use uh, the influence that we do have and the approach that we take uh, to good effect in a pragmatic way. Um, Kieran, as usual, asks very different, difficult questions. Um, um, you know, Ireland's proposition in a post-COVID world uh, where many countries are starting to look inward rather than outward, uh, where global trade has undoubtedly been disrupted in a major way, um, uh, and of course, sustainability, uh, both environmentally and from a supply chains and public health perspective, uh, is now the big focus. You know, I think Ireland is reasonably well placed there. You know, we're part of a big common market within the European Union. We're an exporting country. Uh, we have created very secure and robust supply chains with the United States. You know, we have a trade relationship with the US that's worth about 130 billion euros every year. Um, that employs hundreds of thousands of people on both sides of the Atlantic. And even through COVID, those supply chains have been very robust and secure. Uh, and I think it's important uh, to, to mention that. And so, you know, the, the tests that, that, COVID have, uh, that COVID has provided to those supply chains, uh, I think uh, are a reinforcer that in a post-COVID world, the U.S., and U.S. companies can rely on Ireland as a platform for international trade, uh, which is very, very solid and predictable. Um, and so uh, you will see the Irish government pursue a much more proactive approach on climate and on emissions. Uh, we have made some pretty serious commitments around reducing emissions internationally between now and 2030, uh, about 7% reduction per year on average. Um, that is a really significant commitment from an Irish perspective, but, but we want to be a world leader in this space. And we believe that's good business as well as good for the environment. Um, the, uh, and then the final question um, on, a, on the reunification of, of the island of Ireland, if and when that can happen and how. The first thing I'd say is I think it's really important not to conflate this issue with Brexit. Uh, and some people have chosen to do that, to say, look, the solution 
for Northern Ireland and the peace process in the context of Brexit and the United Kingdom leaving the EU is a border pole uh, to lead to, uh, to the reunification uh, North and South and the island of Ireland. I think that that uh, argument is flawed, has made finding solutions to the Brexit challenge is much more difficult. We have a solution on Brexit. It's in the Irish and Northern Irish Protocol, in an international treaty that's now part of international law. We now have to implement that. Um, I am a constitutional nationalist. I would like to see the reunification of Ireland in the future. Um, but I also recognize that there is a process um, that, that I think we all need to follow uh, that, uh, of reassurance, of bridge building, of reaching out to, to communities that may see themselves as very vulnerable uh, to that change, uh, to try to provide reassurance and structures that can, um, uh, that can respond to that anxiety. So that if and when that happens in the future, by democratic means, under the framework of the Good Friday Agreement, um, that it happens in a way that's not threatening and doesn't lead to further tension and division and potential violence in the future. Um, so. So as I say, um, the, the, uh, they are challenges that people like me and others need to take on in terms of building those political relationships between North and South, between unionists and nationalists, and people who don't regard themselves as either. Um, so that if that decision is made, as I say, democratically in the future, in a way that's consistent with the Good Friday Agreement and the principle of consent in both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, that that happens in a way that avoids the kind of fears of um, minorities uh, in the future um, so that we learn lessons from, from the past. Um, so that's, that's what I would say to that. Uh, now is the time to resolve Brexit, to, to reinforce the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement, to make sure that they can function in the interests of people and relationships on the island of Ireland and in Northern Ireland in particular, where you know, politics is vulnerable, to put it mildly. Um, the bigger questions around constitutional change are something that we should build up to through dialogue and through bridge building and through reassurance over time. Um, uh, and um, you know, I think that is the responsible way to approach it. And I hope Irish America uh, will, will support us in the context of those efforts so that we can try to solve one problem at a time um, in a way that's, um, that's responsible and doesn't result in uh, in an unwinding in many ways of the extraordinary progress that we've made over the last 25 years in the context of peace in Northern Ireland. So um, I think I've answered all the questions and uh, thank you for the, the detail. Minister, thank you for answering all those questions. Uh, we've come to the end of our hour. I just want to say personally, um, what a great um, session this has been. I hope that the United States will return to cooperation with the European Union not competition, and with Ireland as a major conduit. We certainly, all of us who are Irish American, are very proud of the extraordinary influence that Ireland has in the world now. I might even suggest that from our perspective, Ireland might be at its strongest and most vibrant. And you've described it as an expanding presence in the world, and we welcome that. And finally, I just want to say, you may be the only person in Washington, D.C. today who will have equal access and equally good conversations with both Republicans and Democrats. Thank you for uniting us. And thank goodness for the fact that Republicans, Democrats, we're all together in supporting a strong future of the US-Irish relationship. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, you know, I know that this forum is a, is a very significant one in terms of both foreign policy and security policy. And it's really been a real privilege to uh, to have an hour or so talking with you. And uh, if we can play a small part in bringing America together, that would be a good thing. Um, I have been very deliberate in, in not referring to, to the debate this evening or the tensions between Republicans and Democrats. That's not my place, of course. That's, that's a matter for internal domestic uh, politics here. But it is true to say uh, that America is a divided country looking from afar. Um, and that is something that I hope uh, in a post-election period, whoever wins that election, uh, they will be able to heal some of those divisions. Uh, and that's something that I think Irish America would, uh, would support. And certainly as an Irish government, um, uh, we would support as well.
Thank you, Minister. Thank you for being with the Aspen Security Forum. Many thanks to you, Ambassador Mohal, and many thanks, thanks to the great Neve King, our secret Irish weapon at the Aspen Security Forum. <laughs> Minister, we'll see you soon. Good luck on your talks today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for being with us.